Buckle up, folks. I had an entire script written out for this video, and then I had to rewrite the whole thing once I was done. We could have just named this one Mike Makes a Bunch of People Mad and Writes Headcanon. Hey, everyone. I edited this video, and then it turned out to be the longest video I've ever made. And I know 25 minutes is a pretty long time to listen to me talk. So there's a timestamp if you just want to skip to the end where I go over the abridged version of my theory. I think you should listen to the whole video because the explanation of how I got to where I got to, I think is fun and interesting. But if you are cramped for time, you can just go to the end and you'll get the like point by point of what I think can work here. That's all, have fun. Hot diggity dog. So like a little over a week ago, we got a blast of news when we found out that Riot Forge was releasing all three of the projects that we currently know about in 2023. But then Riot also released another dev video where they talked about the future of League as a game. The title of that video said it would talk about lore and I think a lot of League fans were expecting a little bit more than what we got. But in my opinion, that little tidbit of news was huge. In that update and in the ensuing Reddit comments, Riot confirmed that they are currently working towards an active unification of what is canon across Legends of Runeterra, across League of Legends, and across Arcane. One unified storyline that will ensure a level of consistency no matter where somebody is experiencing the world of Runeterra. This is huge news. If you've watched my recent long form videos, if you haven't, go bump those view counts up real quick for me. You know my stance. Whatever your feelings are about the individual specifics involved, Arcane's gotta be canon. It just makes sense. It's a major, major entry point into the world of Runeterra and its characters, and it just doesn't make sense for that entry point to be incongruent with the rest of the reality of Runeterra. It's also worth noting that this change doesn't just involve Arcane, but also involves Legends of Runeterra. But part of what I like about Legends of Runeterra is that the details that we get there about the world are very tertiary and world building, so it's easy to fit in alongside what already exists for canon. And consequently, for the purposes of this video, we're going to talk about Arcane. I understand that for some, this change is going to mean modifications to your favorite champion's bio or storyline or even in some cases personality. And I think anybody who winds up bummed as a result of the changes or is already bummed about that totally valid. But on this channel, we do not wallow. We forge boldly onward into our new unified existence. And that means some stuff's got to change. So in this video, I'm going to break down the differences between arcane and the current canon as it relates to world building. And by the end, I'm going to paint you a picture of what I think the reworked canon could look like. Now, it's important to know this is a speculative video. I am going to talk about facts about the current canon, but my theories are just speculation. I am not a professional writer, and some of this is based on interpretation of what we have available for stuff like Arcane specifically. So I ask you just not regurgitate my video as fact. You can agree, you can disagree, but in reality, the real writers will find a much better way to integrate all of this stuff together. I'm just waxing poetic because it's fun to speculate for the purpose of discussion. A second disclaimer for both new and returning viewers. Typically on this channel, I focus on Runeterra at a broad world building level, a very like macro level, and then we zoom down to micro as we need to. The reason for this is simple. It's just what interests me. As a result, I don't often focus on the fine specific points of an individual character's story. There's going to be some of that in this video because with how character driven Arcane is as a show, it's just sort of inevitable that we have to talk about that. But I am going to try and focus on the world implications of this change. Other creators have already done videos on things like, as an example, the difference between Echo's canon storyline and Echo in Arcane. Those videos are going to be much better for addressing that than anything I'm going to make now a year after Arcane's first release. But in general, my stance is that I think basically all the character development in Arcane and the character portrayals are better than what we have in the current canon. But again, like that's personal taste. So that stuff's going to get touched on, but I probably won't go in depth to the individual characters. However, I'm happy to talk about it in the comments below. Speaking of which, if you like this video, please drop a like hit the subscribe button, and for the love of God, please write a comment. I don't care what you write. You can write papaya for all I care. It's the best way you can support this channel. It really helps more people see the video, and it really just means a lot. I actually do read all the comments. Okay, it's time. Let's dive in. One of the big reasons I don't feel like this announcement is a sky is falling, earth shattering ramifications announcement is that the story of Arcane is mostly contained to Piltover and Zaun. There are some minor story beats that involve some things outside of the city, but for the most part, the bulk of the changes required to integrate Arcane into the canon are going to be confined to that region. The Freljord, Targon, Demacia, Ionia, 
Bilgewater, the Shadow Isles, Ishtal, former Akathia. All these places have very little to no ties to what's happening in Arcane. And when there is an implication for these, it's very small. So small that it's not worth mentioning in this video. There's a little more implication at play with Sharima as it relates specifically to Hextech as well as Ashra Vazan. But on the whole, most of Sharima is actually exempt from this as well. And for Noxus, Noxus is obviously mentioned and has a hand in Piltover through the Madarda clan. But the implications to Noxus and Noxus Noxus' storylines aren't substantial. Most of the heavy results of Noxus are again going to be focused to the Piltover and Zaun region. I wish there was a clearer jumping off point for what we need to talk about in terms of what needs to change, but all of these changes are really heavily tied together, at least to me. The big things that I think we have to talk about change-wise are the timeline, so how Piltover and Zaun relates to historic Runeterra and where Arcane actually takes place, Piltover and Zaun's own history, so how the cities became split, the founding and advancement, and their power structures. Hextech may be the one that touches sort of the most individual changes, where it comes from, who's responsible for discovery and production, and a bunch of other little things as well. And then finally, character stuff, which like I said, is not going to be the focal point of this video, but probably will come up a little bit. Maybe I'll think of more stuff as we go. For now, let's dive into the timeline. For starters, let's take a look at the official timeline of Runeterra, taken from the Realms of Runeterra sourcebook. A bunch of events are discussed on these two pages, but we're going to look at one area in particular, between the Rune Wars and the tragedy on the River Pilt. A brief explanation of these two events. The Rune Wars were a magic-focused World War equivalent that left a lot of the world in shambles and happened in the wake of the Ruination, where magical artifacts were taken from Helia and fell into the wrong hands. Big paraphrasing there, but basically, magical nuclear war. The impact on the world itself were devastating. The second event, the tragedy on the river Pilt, happened when the city of Zaun, formerly Ashra of Azan, attempted to excavate land in order to build a more efficient trade channel for ships. This sunk massive portions of the city into the caverns below, and predates the founding of Piltover as a separate, air quotes, city, since that happened in the wake of newfound trade after they rebuilt from the rubble. In the canon timeline, the tragedy on the river Pilt happens just under 800 years after what we know as the end of the Rune Wars. Consequently, that means that Piltover didn't exist as a named city until at least that point. Still with me? Good. Ignoring the differences in the city, the naming, and how it was founded, if we look at just the timeline alone, we now have our first potential discrepancy. And the root cause of our discrepancy? Our pal Heimerdinger. In Arcane, Heimerdinger is established to be 307 years old in the first act of the show, and like the 314 or so for Acts 2 and 3, he is also named as one of the founders of Piltover, the City of Progress, and later in the show it's mentioned that Piltover is 200 years old. So Piltover was founded around when Heimerdinger was like 107, 110 years old, give or take. All good so far. But Heimerdinger? <sighs> Heimerdinger has a memory in the second episode when Jace is on trial, where he mentions that only he can understand what Jace is trifling with, recreating magic, and the horrors that it has wrought. Now, this memory and reference isn't explicitly stated to be the Rune Wars, but the Rune Wars is the most intense magical conflict we know of in Runeterra, so it makes sense that that would be what he was referring to. I, and I do not believe I'm alone in this, have assumed that this was meant to be discussing the Rune Wars. And he could have just read about the Rune Wars, but if he had just known about them historically, it would be weird to say that it was a burden that only he could carry, because I assume the rest of the council members can read. That would imply that at some point in Heimerdinger's 107 years preceding the founding of Piltover, he experienced some portion of the Rune Wars. And even if we assume he was just born into them right at the end, 107 is less than 772. Now, if this memory is in fact discussing the Rune Wars, then we have a massive timeline issue to resolve, which could be done any variety of ways. You could attribute it to the difference in Yordle life and aging. You could simply try and compress the timeline. You could say, Heimerdinger just knew about it historically. But all these solutions introduce their own problems, ranging from, why does Heimerdinger think only he bears the burden to this? Two, if you compress the timeline, all the characters in Arcane are dead by the present day in Runeterra. My solution? Much simpler. You just make it so that Heimerdinger is not referring to the Rune Wars here if he ever was. He's either referring to a generalized, unknown to us use of magic, which is perfectly plausible, mages didn't disappear after the Rune Wars, and we know Noxus by 772 has been in Imperial power for some time, reasonable to believe they've utilized magic in some pretty devastating ways themselves. Or, if you want to come with me on an imagination journey, he is, in some part, 
referring to the tragedy on the River Pilt. Perhaps the botched excavation was due in some part to magic and not just chemtech bombs. And the devastation in the wake of that event is what Heimerdinger is worried about. It's not a perfect solution. There's a throwaway line from a counselor about how Piltover is founded to escape the warmongering of mages, which definitely sounds Rune wars -y. But ultimately, it's a way that all of this fits into our existing understanding of the current timeline without any major retconning being required. This is the first piece of the just Blaze unification theory, or Mike's unification theory, I don't know, branding. Let's just, we're gonna take this and we're gonna squirrel it away for a second for when we come back to the overall grand theory. Let's move on from the broader timeline and get into some Piltover and Zon specifics. Okay, in the current canon, the evolution to get to modern day Piltover and Zaun looks like this. First, there was the ancient port city of Ashra Vazan. Over time, it simply became known as Zaun. Zaun experiences a serious historical event, the tragedy on the river Pilt, where large swaths of it are sunk into the caverns of the ancient port below. It's rebuilt, the sun gates are constructed, and eventually the disparate wealth leads to the separation of Piltover and Zaun as distinct entities even if they encompass generally the same geographical footprint. So what's different? In Arcane, we're introduced to the city right away as Piltover with the District of the Undercity, which, like the Zaun of Canon, goes deep down and has different levels and is juxtaposed next to the clean, faux-utopia look of Piltover. We know there was an uprising of some kind, we see it at the start of the show, that occurred after the separation between Piltover and the Undercity seemingly already existed. But really, aside from that, they don't touch on the history of the city at all. And that means there's a lot of room for the historical background of Arcane to match up and fit just fine with the current canon. Ashra Vazan can still easily be the name and origin of the port city long before Arcane happened. Similarly, although Silco presents Zaun as the name of the new sovereign version of the Undercity at the end of Arcane, that name could easily be derived from history. Follow me on this line of thinking for a second. Ashur of Vazan still exists in the past and becomes the city of Zaun. Zaun still tries to excavate a canal on the river Pilt, still sinks a huge portion of the city. The city rebuilds itself and with the advent of the new canal becomes a trade city of importance in its own right and renames itself Piltover. And as I said before, perhaps in this instance, magic is used in this excavation and that leads to their general disdain for magic at the current juncture. But that's not even really necessary for this. The class divide post renaming to Piltover is created, which leads to the rebellion that we see at the start of Arcane. People who are mad that the historical Zaun has now become this city divided in Piltover. And that means that when Silco chooses the name of Zaun, He's trying to invoke the historical importance of what was before Piltover. I'm definitely not a writer, but that would track with me. And aside from some small changes, a good portion of the normal history of Piltover and Zaun is now maintained. This does leave the question of the Sun Gates and the Hex Gates. The Hex Gates are, of course, Jace's shining product after Act 1 of Arcane. They are what Hextech seems to be used for initially, before they stabilize it into being relatively safe for consumer products. They're credited with bringing more prosperity and a new level of global trade to Piltover. In canon, the Sun Gates were built after Zaun was rebuilt following the tragedy on the River Pilt, and they were used to regulate the trade in the passage that was created. Eventually, they actually have Hextech implemented into them as well. At first glance, it seems like the Hex Gates of Arcane were meant to just be different replacements for the Sun Gates. But here's the thing, when we get a view of Piltover in the first act of Arcane before Hextech is even a thing, it's clear that the city has been successful. Look at the politicking, the architecture, and the structure of the city. This is a city of wealth. So what if the Sun Gates actually do exist in Arcane and we just haven't seen them because they weren't a focal point of the story that was being told? This justification would make some level of sense. They enable trade in a way that wouldn't have required the magic of Hextech, and it would have allowed certain houses to elevate themselves above others in a rise to power in Piltover. And then the Hextech just falls into place later and expands that prosperity further. So what are we plucking out of this discussion? In summary, Ashra Vazan and Historical Zon still existed in the past. When the tragedy on the River Pilt occurs, the city is rebuilt, the Sun Gates are built, prosperity comes, and the city is renamed Piltover, a symbolic effort to help prevent what happened from ever happening again. Okay, the final big thing that I want to talk about specifically is Hextech. If we talk about the world-building implicating pillars between Arcane and the current canon, Hextech is a big one. It has a bunch of little world-building branches that all come off the central idea of the tech. 
All that said, I actually think with a couple smaller changes, Arcane and the current canon hex decks can actually meld together fairly well. In the canon, Hextech originates from the mercantile clans of Piltover. One clan, Pharos, is basically responsible for the original collection and implementation of the Hex Crystals, which they harvested from the Brackern, a race of sentient crystal scorpions hailing from Shurima. While Clan Pharos first used this and was also responsible for coming up with the way to manufacture synthetic Hextech, the Medarda clan was the one responsible for helping bring Hextech to the masses. We also know, as an aside, that the Pharos clan kept Hextech to themselves for a while. It was implemented into Camille's body augmentations and Pharos's own in-house tech and experiments long before it was brought to the general public. By the time Jace gets around to it, Hextech is a known quantity, although his bio specifically discusses experimentation on what seems to be a drained Hextech crystal with minimal success. In contrast, Arcane has Hextech just being discovered when we come into the story by Jason Victor specifically. When Pharos is mentioned, it's only in passing and it's specifically cited as one of the regions that the Medarda family is so rich. Clan Medarda, largely represented by Mel, is still responsible for funding Jace's research, and so in most respects, you could still say they're responsible for bringing Hextech to all of Piltover. The big question mark here is Pharos. Pharos, and by extension Camille, are essential parts of Hextech's history in the canon, but they don't really come up over the course of its invention in Arcane. This is cited as one of the biggest discrepancies between the two mediums. But what if I told you with a little creative thinking, there's actually plenty of room for Pharos to still be involved in Hextech's creation in Arcane. See, here's the thing, folks. Arcane Jace's experience with magic is rooted in his experience as a child when a mage saves him and his mother. We see this mage give Jace a shard of what is, ostensibly, a Hextech crystal. And then flash forward to many years later when Jace suddenly has five full Hextech crystals that are stolen from his lab. Did you catch that? He goes from one shard to five crystals. Where did these crystals come from, Jace? And that, my friends, that's how we pull Pharos into the Arcane storyline. I posit the theory that Jace likely had to work with someone else in order to get more samples of the crystal that he had a tiny shard of. And that partner? That could be House Pharos. Pharos must already be a powerful force in Piltover at the start of Arcane if they're responsible for the Medardo wealth. And if they were able to help Jace procure more Hex crystals, that would pull them into the early development of Hextech, even behind the scenes. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that if that's the case, it even makes sense that Pharos would do their own experiments tucked away in their own labs on the Hextech crystals. This still does sort of ultimately leave the problem of Camille, because she has some specific Hextech like in her heart and in her body augmentations that help keep her youthful appearance, among other things. Whether it's you changed the story so that her initial body modifications didn't have Hextech and it was implemented later, or you just say... Pharos actually did know how to use these crystals and just kept it to themselves, which lines up with main canon. They did keep that knowledge to themselves for a long time. The only thing outstanding really with House Medarda is the topic of Noxian influence. And I'm going to be honest with you, this one doesn't really bug me at all. Yes, in canon, we don't know of anybody in Medarda with Noxian heritage. But to be honest, in main canon, Medarda doesn't have much of anything at all. And in the short story Progress Day, it's actually mentioned that Noxus does have an agent in the Medarda clan collecting intelligence for them. Colette. So the idea of Noxus being a driving force behind the Medarda clan the whole time, that's the easiest hand wave I've ever done in my whole life. In my opinion, it's not even really something that has to be addressed. Now I'm going to touch on Jace and Victor's relationship because it's important to the founding of Hextech in Arcane. In canon, these two have a much more antagonistic relationship with one another, alongside just sort of different personalities in general. But they do start out as peers. Jace sees Victor as somebody that can match his level of intelligence. And so for the purposes of Arcane, I think it's safe to say we just haven't gotten to that point in their story yet. But Victor's role in the founding of Hextech in Arcane is important for a really different reason, and it's about the Void. In Arcane, we see the Hex Crystal, specifically the Hex Core, react with Victor's blood in a way that seems to create void magic. Now, it's not confirmed that it's actually void magic, but the implication feels strong. The visuals match a lot of what we see in void art today, and the color matches, so that's honestly good enough for me. In the canon, there's nothing that really ties blood and magic to the Void. In fact, while you maybe shouldn't necessarily take this specifically as canon, Void was once described as the absence of everything, including magic. So on the surface, the idea that blood plus hex core could somehow tap into Void is like a little weird. But with a little stretching, we can get there, sort of. 
It actually forces us to turn to Shuriman history, specifically the fall of the Ascended God Warriors and the Void War and the Great Darken War. The trauma of the Void War is what gave the Ascended the PTSD that ultimately broke them when Azir died, after which some of them reshaped their bodies, utilizing blood magic. Now, where did they learn the blood magic? That's a little bit up in the air, but I posit the theory that blood magic for reshaping the body is something that they could have seen and experienced during the Void War. And in Arcane, what is Victor trying to do? He's trying to fix his broken body. So what if the voidish power here that Victor taps into that leaves him looking a little weird is actually a form of blood magic, which is tied to the Void in some capacity? Of all the theories that I randomly throw out in this video, this is like the one that maybe worries me the most about super toxic comments. So let's just do another friendly reminder that I'm just speculating. Um, so yeah. And the final thing I want to touch on briefly from a world building perspective in this video is Chemtech and the Chem Barons. We see a ton of instances of what could only be Chemtech in Arcane, and we see it with both green and purple pink chemicals. In the canon universe, Chemtech also has different colors, which usually denote the level of refinement that the chemicals have undergone. For example, Renata Glask's Chemtech is usually shown as purple pink, indicating that it's a more refined, more expensive version of Chemtech. In Arcane, we see Shimmer used in addition to green Chemtech, and Shimmer isn't something that really exists in the same way in the current canon, although we do see references sometimes to a Shimmer-like compound. In general, all of this is honestly pretty harmless and interplays fine with one another. I'm super okay with Shimmer just being a name for a refined version of Chemtech that also happens to function as a drug at that point, especially since it's pretty well shown that Shimmer is like very bad for your body. I think the biggest discrepancy here is the Chem Barons themselves, and specifically Renata Glass whom is a large player in the Chem Baron space and is noticeably absent from Arcane's roster of Chem Barons. This could be explained away as her simply not rising to power yet when Arcane is occurring, but it leaves small inconsistencies again with the timeline, mostly relative to other characters like Echo and Zonites in general. And ultimately, those little character inconsistencies are symbolic of a larger point that I'm going to get to now. Despite what I've tried to do in this video and meld as much of the world building for Arcane the canon as possible to make them fit together, there's not really a way that we come out of this without some character bio edits and backstory changes. They don't all have to be major, and most I think will probably be for the best, but as many other content creators have gone over since the release of Arcane, most of these character stories specifically are incongruent with their canon versions. The point of this video was not to demonstrate how everything will fit cleanly together with no need for retcons at all. It was simply to showcase that in the broad sense of the world, a lot of these things can actually fit together or be explained to fit together better than it may initially seem. And with that, let us summarize. Here's the abridged version of my arcane unification theory. I have never wished I knew how to do cool graphics more than I do right now. 1. Ashura Vazan still existed historically. There's no reason for this to not have been the case prior to the events of Arcane. Similarly, it's perfectly fine for it to still have been renamed Zaun prior to the tragedy on the River Pilt. 2. The tragedy on the River Pilt occurs, and whether it's a public view of Chemtech bombs or straight-up mages, magic can be some way involved with the botched excavation. It's not exactly the same as what we know right now, but also extremely, extremely plausible. 3. When Heimerdinger, and also maybe this guy, I actually didn't talk about him at all in this video, but I still think he might potentially be talking about the Rune Wars, talks about seeing the havoc that magic wreaked, he wasn't talking about the Rune Wars like I and many other people thought. He was actually referring to the tragedy on the River Pilt, or less interestingly, some other magical fight. This would mean that Heimerdinger is 107 years old-ish at the time of the tragedy, witnesses it occurring, and helps rebuild the city and found Piltover as a way to attempt to ensure that this type of catastrophe doesn't happen again. And then, 200 years later, when Arcane takes place, would sit roughly around 980 AN on the calendar, putting us firmly within spitting distance of the modern day in Runeterra. The timeline now mostly makes sense without us having to perform any kind of timey-wimey manipulation. 6. Jason Victor discover Hextech, utilizing Hex crystals that were actually procured by House Pharaohs. Remember, in Arcane, the only thing we actually see is Jace get a tiny shard of Hex crystal by the mage that saved him and his mom. We have no information about their origin otherwise. We establish that Pharaohs got these crystals and gave them to Jace for one reason or another. This allows Pharaohs to still be instrumental in the founding of Hextech, but allows Madarda to be who's responsible for bringing Hextech to the masses, which is really what we see in Arcane Season 1. It even opens up the slim possibility that Pharaohs has already figured out how to utilize these sorts of crystals, and just like in canon, kept that knowledge extremely close to their chest for a long period of time. 
And finally, seven, Silco proposes the name of Zaun for the newly sovereign Undercity, not as a brand new name out of his hat, but as a historical callback to a time that once was, a time before the opulence and superiority complex of Piltover. I think this thing works. It may not be the prettiest, it requires some concessions about some things, and I definitely don't think that it was the initial intent in some cases. But it does prevent a large swath of changes from occurring and maintains the structure that we already have in place for both Arcane and the current canon. There's always, of course, just like the nuclear option that they do a Runeterran flashpoint event with like a zillion and Echo, but that would be a much shorter video, and then how would I farm you for views? Thanks for watching. I look forward to what I'm sure will be a very calm discussion in the comments below, and I'm excited to see what you all think. Okay, bye.